Hi everyone and welcome. I've got a couple worm bins I need to be fed. And they're the ones that you see down at the bottom on the left. These two are my youngest red wiggler bins. Over here on the right is even a younger bin that's only a couple days old, but that's got European night crawlers in it. As far as my red wigglers are concerned, these two here are my youngest. And when I feed my red wigglers, I often try to pair them up into little buddy systems. So right now these two are serving as the young group, the younger group. And then the, the ones that you see right above them are actually the ones that count as the older group. Everything else that you see are maybe, for example, red wigglers that are now foraging, so they're not really being fed any further, as well as other night crawler systems. So at the moment, all my red wigglers are concentrated in this lower left corner. And the ones I'm targeting for feeding today, after eight days since their last feeding are the ones on the bottom there, at the present time, they're 30 days old of age and 75 days old of age. Pretty easy numbers for me to remember. I didn't have to bring my little cheat sheet. <laughs> now, the stuff I'm feeding are, you know, pretty much a standard fare. You've got all kinds of vegetable cuttings here. This is like the, the big root or the big stem end of a head of cauliflower here. Um, banana peels, obviously. Other little tiny scraps of this and that. Grab a handful of other junk to throw in here to complement the um, the other routine stuff, which is a little bit of used coffee as well as the used filters. And what you see over here is pulverized eggshell. Pulverized eggshell is what I'm including as grit in my feeding. So I'm going to get these bins up on the bench and we'll get to feeding right away. We're beginning here with the 30 day old system, the younger one. And it's a, it's a pretty run-of-the-mill system. There's nothing really extraordinary about it. It's using one of these funny little plastic-covered cardboard tops that I use sometimes. I guess the whole idea is that I can handle the plastic with a single hand, manipulate it, and change its orientation and space and whatever, while I use my other gloved hand to try to knock off any little worms that might have come along for the ride. I guess the only disadvantage is that I often take the plastic coverings that I'm removing temporarily and I simply fold them in half so that the worms are not put off by the bright lights or the, you know, the encroaching dryness of the air. But we'll try to, you know, give whatever worms that might still be on that plastic a little bit of a break by covering that plastic up with this piece of paper towel because this thing's pretty soaked, it's nice and damp. So if there are any little tiny worms still stuck to any of those castings on that piece of plastic, then hopefully they'll be sheltered from the bright lights that might scare them away and cause them to flee. We've got other little scraps of bedding here, little pieces of cardboard. I believe these pieces of cardboard actually um, stem back to the final um, addition of worms into this system. I believe that the, these pieces of cardboard, yeah, th this piece of cardboard would have been what I was using to um, separate the feeding zone of the system that these worms came from um, to partition it from the finished casting material. And I just figured this would also kind of make some good top covering material over here. I would think that these scraps of paper might have been the previous generation of top covering paper. Perhaps it got a little bit too tattered to serve that purpose anymore. So we got a little bit of um, scrap bedding laying around here, but it's a new bin. So I like to be pretty generous with the um, with certain things. Certain things I like to try to include a little bit more of in the earlier stages of a bin's life cycle. One of them is bedding. So, you know, I usually don't have any qualms about adding um, leaves, cardboard, paper, all kinds of stuff like that to new bins. Because I know there's plenty of time for that stuff to break down. It's in my older bins where I tend to shy away from putting too much bedding materials in. Only because I don't want to have to pick all that stuff out later if I'm, you know, going to get to the point where I'm ready to harvest the castings. Now this stuff here on top, somehow it just doesn't have the appearance of castings. I could be wrong. Somehow it makes me think that it's coffee. 
Somehow it's got that appearance to it. I don't know why. So we could already be starting to see some of the leftovers from the previous feeding. But that's not going to hold us back from feeding today. I'm usually the type who will acknowledge the fact that there's still food in there from previous feedings. But I'll, uh, I'll usually just press on with the plan to feed. And we can already see some of the food items that, you know, date back to previous feedings. These are all banana stems. They're pretty easy to identify. Quite a bit of them in here, actually. And then I think the coffee, as we spoke about a moment ago, is also a, a food item, which um, seems to have survived the past eight days since this bin was last fed. And then down here, there's just more scraps of paper and whatnot, other types of bedding materials. I'm just going to try to get a sense of the moisture here, because as I was picking through this area here, it did feel to me like it might have been a little bit drier than it needs to be. Even though we got that nice plastic covering across the entire top of the system, um, the material in here does seem to be a little bit drier than it needs to be. So here we've got an entire coffee filter. We've got a whole bunch of bedding over here. It's all good stuff. The worms love the bedding. So all the way down here at the bottom, we're finding the worms because what they like even more than the bedding is the moisture. So the moisture in this case seems to be collecting near the bottom of the system, which is where the worms are kind of drawn to. Totally understandable. Here's more, more bedding type materials, more paper. There's a good amount of it in here. In this one though, there was a whole bunch of coffee kind of chunked up in the corner of the filter. So I just dislodged it and kind of sprinkled it down into the feeding area. Even more coffee filter. I came prepared to include coffee filters with today's feeding. Just wondering if we should just stick to giving them food only. Now, you know, this is only a 30 day old bin. There's plenty of time for all this carbon based bedding type materials to get broken down. So I'll just stick to the original game plan. We will add even more bedding than it's in here already. Moisture though, you know, everyone has a different perspective on the moisture level in their bins. I, in the past, I always felt like I was very skimpy on the moisture, and my bins always seemed to run very dry. But after I started covering my bins about a year ago now, with plastic coverings, the, the moisture seems to remain pretty nicely within the systems. It doesn't get lost to the evaporation. Uh, up until then, I had always used just paper-based coverings, you know, maybe a sheet of newspaper, maybe a piece of cardboard, but that resulted in a fairly dry top layer. And naturally, because it was dry, it was pretty much free of any worm traffic. The worms will always avoid material that's perhaps a bit too dry for them, especially if there's nice and damp stuff nearby that they can move into pretty easily. So the plastic coverings have been doing a really nice job, but then, you know, sometimes it even goes in the opposite direction, where the plastic coverings retain too much moisture within the system, causing the material to just get a little bit too damp. And then that's a pain too, because then you're left with the challenge of trying to get that stuff to dry off. It makes the stuff kind of a... a pain in the neck to handle it's all clumpy and sticky so uh, I'm still working on how to achieve that correct balance that ideal balance to maintain just the right moisture level to keep the worms happy but not to let the material in the bin go overboard and get soaked so let's see what we could do about restoring a whole bunch of this carbon rich paper type bedding materials down into the pit where we're going to add the food. I guess we'll um, maybe we'll just reserve those last two pieces of cardboard strips to remain as top covering the way they were when we found them originally. That would be this piece and this piece right here. But all the rest of these other pieces of paper that we found along the way can certainly go down into the feeding area. So 
So we've got, uh, this is the younger bin, so I figured maybe the younger bin would get this really big chunk of stem. It's frozen solid. I thought about perhaps hacking it up into slightly smaller pieces before bringing it down here, but I didn't feel like battling with it since it's frozen. I just figured we'd stick it in here, let it go for one feeding cycle, and then the next time we see it, it'll probably be, probably be nice and soft. It'll probably will have been infiltrated by bacteria and microbes and start into the breakdown process. And at that time, we can maybe try to tear it into smaller chunks or something. Um, so that's about half, right? We'll give them that. And here's the, um, the coffee filters that I allocated to today's feeding. I don't know, maybe one will be enough. We'll save the other two. Not, not remembering exactly what the deal was in the other bin. Maybe we'll, um, we'll use one for this bin and we'll use two for the other bin. Maybe we'll even make these pieces of paper a little bit smaller by tearing them up. Alrighty. Now another, uh, Another fairly important thing that the worms depend on to be able to eat their food is some sort of a gritty, you know, tiny coarse substance like this, which is um, pulverized eggshell. You know, after many, many feedings, you might expect there to be a good amount of that stuff in a system if it received some during every feeding, um, which is probably true, but this is still a fairly new bin. It might have only received three or four feedings up until now. So in systems like this, I think it is pretty um, pretty much a good idea, at least in the beginning, to include um, grit along with the food. So yeah, let's not forget to return some of these older food scraps to the feeding area. This should work out pretty nicely. All of the older stuff will be closer to the surface. These are red wigglers, so they're going to prefer to try to feed near the surface, I think. So we'll put the more readily accessible, easier to eat stuff that's partially broken down already near the surface. And the stuff that's down low will have a chance to get infiltrated by the bacteria and the fungi and let it start breaking down. I'm sure worms will go for some of that as well, but, um, you know, I guess stuff that's closer to the surface, some people will suggest that red wigglers are going to want to gravitate to the surface to feed and look for food sources. So we're just going to lay it out there for them. The older broken down stuff that's probably a little bit easier for them to eat. So now to cover up this feeding area, you know what? I almost forgot my coffee. I have a tendency to forget the coffee for some reason. I get kind of caught up in what I'm doing and then I get sidetracked my thinking. <laughs> but I do have some coffee that I want to dump in here too. So we'll give them about half of what I bought down here. And we'll see what becomes of it. It might just be sitting there on the surface when we get back in here next time. We'll see. I guess I'll just start pulling up some of this stuff on the sides to try to cover up with. What is all this? All this white makes me think that it's some sort of a fungus, maybe a mold or something. Typically not a problem in a bin, I believe. Most of the times, you know, it's one form of another, one form or another of microscopic life forms like mold or fungi or something like that. Bacteria that's going to get a foothold in the material that's in your bins to help it break down. And then the worms, I believe, actually come along and eat that too. So that becomes their food source. So it's a key component for sure in any good healthy worm bin. Nothing to be worried about. Here I'm finding all kinds of unbroken down leafy materials. The moisture on this side seems pretty decent. So it's not it's not a bin that's necessarily plagued with dryness, just little spots of dryness here and there. So I usually count on the foods that I'm adding to be the moisture source, usually. And they do a pretty good job just as those frozen foods start to thaw out and start to emit some of their moisture, they they um, they share that moisture with the rest of the materials in the bin. And then the plastic coverings kind of force all the moisture levels within the bin to equalize. 
and um, and then things are pretty much consistently damp throughout. Although from time to time you will find little pockets of drier and wetter sections in your bin, that's for sure. So this looks pretty good. I guess these will be our feeding zone indicators for now. <laughs> Not that it's so necessary or important to do so, but I like to mark where I last fed with something, and in this case it'll just be these couple strips of cardboard. Once they get so far gone that they're just useful as bedding anymore, maybe we'll upgrade to some sort of another feeding zone indicator, perhaps a coffee filter. But we're done here. We're going to get things covered up kind of the way we found them. This paper towel seems to be doing pretty good as a top covering. It's been here for a number of weeks. And there's cer certain sections of it where you can see the worms have nibbled out sections of it. And that's what it's there for, really, as far as I'm concerned. They're welcome to it. That, too, once it deteriorates, it, too, will be replaced with some other sort of a top covering. But for now, it seems to be in great shape. Cool. Let's get the other system out here, the 75-day-old bin, and feed that one. Okay. So now here in the 75-day-old bin, there's a couple little oddities going on here. A couple little oddball things. Ooh. I guess one thing that I've been trying to cope with in some of my bins is insects. And I've been suspicious of corrugated cardboard materials. Assuming that the insects like to crawl into the into the material, into the cardboard, in between the folds of the corrugated. So I've been gradually doing away with the cardboard coverings on some of my systems. These two Ziploc bags that you see here on top, when we, la when we last left this bin, we had replaced the covering, the plastic covering, with this, which is a, um, a sheet of, what is it again? Tyvex, I believe it's called, yeah. It's even got a little, uh, it's even got a little Tyvek, that's what it is. It's, um, it says Tyvek is recyclable. Um, Tyvek is, I guess, it's meant to be sort of a um, moisture barrier, so it won't allow moisture to go through it, but it'll allow air to ventilate through it. And I thought it might make for a good covering material on my bin, so this was actually my first try at using it. But one thing I don't like what I'm seeing here is a lot of little mites hanging out on top of it, not to mention a number of little flying insects, too. So, you know, I, I don't want to use materials that are going to become sort of, you know, welcoming spots for insects to hang out on or under or inside of. Um, so I might have to rethink this if this is maybe perhaps a too, too much of an ideal um, surface for the insects to thrive on, then we might have to deny them of it and um, come up with something else. But... When we last left this bin, we had covered with only the Tyvek, and it, to me it seemed like it really wasn't doing a very good job holding the moisture in, because when I came in here to check out how things looked beneath it, I did notice how things seemed a little bit dry. It made me, made me think that maybe it's not really um, keeping the moisture in as well as it could, as far as being a replacement for the plastic coverings that are normally used. And that was the reason I put little sheets of plastic on top of it to see if I can tell a difference later. And as you can see, I don't know if it's coming through on the camera. I believe it is. There's um, a dark spot here, a dark spot here, which is kind of showing where the moisture was unable to pass through the Tyvek and was recirculating underneath the plastic. Um, so it makes me wonder, and it's pretty dry over here where only Tyvek was covering it. So it really makes me wonder if it really is a good replacement for plastic. It might not be. And if, uh, you know, I guess we could let it go maybe one more week, but I'm starting to think that it might be time to replace it with the plastic again so that we can really keep the moisture that's in here trapped, not let it evaporate away. Now, I believe it was a couple feedings ago that we did notice mites walking around all over the place. We, um... We saw them going up and down the walls of the container, walking around the edge of the container. And I think there's even some signs of yeah, what we had tried to use as a countermeasure. We tried putting some diatomaceous earth down in the hopes that it would um, you know, potentially knock out some of these little guys. I'm still seeing 
mites, but definitely not in the numbers that we had seen previously. So that's a good sign. Can't complain. And you know, I just spotted something, but it seems to have vanished. Oh, here it is. Cool. Now this, this is something that I've always considered to be kind of a welcome um, helper creature in my worm bins. These are those little roly polies or isopods, the little bugs that curl up into a perfect sphere if you disturb them. And I just haven't seen them in my systems for some time now. And now here's one. I don't know how it came in, possibly through some of the leaves I've been using to build my bins. I've even thought about going out in the yard and trying to find some and bring them in and have them, um, you know, kind of added to my bins as helper apps, but I think that's a pretty good sign. I like having them in my systems, but for some time I just haven't seen any. So that's pretty cool. So now this bin, I guess, is sort of turning into a little bit of an experiment here. Not only Tyvek coverings to see how well they do, you know, keeping the moisture in the system. Um, this is a system where I'm also trying to compost a couple unusual oddball items. And I can see a little sign of one of them over here. It's a piece of beach towel. And uh, it was a fairly long strip or a couple fairly long strips that I had sort of laid in here. Here's a little bit more of it. I can see hints of the red coloring. It's actually just a scrap of it. But I've not yet really like tried to pull a whole chunk of it out to see how it's coming along. After 75 days, I would have to imagine they must be showing some signs of wear. Besides the um, besides the beach towel, my experiment in trying to compost fabrics. Um, I've also got pine couple pine cones in here too that was also another sort of experimental object so this is sort of a an unusual bin from those perspectives I just watched the video on another YouTube channel on the plant obsessed channel where uh, she kind of invited other vermicomposters to um, to try composting fabrics so she just started into that with a t-shirt and well you know if, if it's okay for me to participate in that, because she invited everyone to sort of participate, then um, I'll consider myself as already being in that experiment with these towels. I got a little bit of a head start though, 75 day head start. And you can see as I grab a piece of it, how easily it tears away. This stuff was out in the sun, sitting in a window with the sun hitting it year after year for many years. So they're, um, there's really no integrity to this fabric. It's just completely um, damaged by the ultraviolet light. So it tears away very readily. Part of the reason that I thought it would be really ideal for composting. So I'm just, uh, I'm just curious about the corners of this bin. The other bin that we just fed kind of came online after my corner feeding, pocket feeding experiment had already ended. So it didn't really have any pocket feedings, but in this system, it was getting fed in the corners up until just a couple feedings ago. So if we want to see a little bit of leftovers of food, we're going to have to check the corners. And here's one of the corners where there's a piece of avocado, a little bit of the material is still on the shell. I don't know, for some reason I don't get the sort of reaction to avocado in my worm bins that other people seem to get. I mean, they, yeah, they like it, but I don't see mobs of worms around the avocado in my cases. I believe in this corner too there might have been some large chunks of pineapple or maybe there were small chunks in these systems I can't remember but I believe that this is where the uh, yeah here's where the pine cone is too <laughs> so yeah there's all kinds of little oddball things going on in this system pine cones towels Tyvek all kinds of weird experimental things going on and now we've also got isopods which is pretty cool. So, a little bit dry on the surface, but certainly nice and damp beneath the surface. So I don't think there's anything to worry about as far as the Tyvek is concerned. Tyvek is concerned. <laughs> um, other than the fact that the, you know, the top surface of the bin just doesn't get the type of um, traffic that it normally would, as if I was covering up with plastic and if the top surface was really the hot spot where all the um, condensing moisture that collects on the plastic drops right down onto. So, uh, like I said, I'm going to continue with the Tyvek for one more feeding, I believe. Just going to go as is. 
with those little supplemental plastic pieces, those little zip locks positioned on top of the Tyvek to sort of force the recirculation in those little isolated zones. But um, at some point I might just decide that I want to um, upgrade back to a piece of plastic covering so that I know that all the moisture in the system is kept within it and not left to evaporate out. Here's more beach towel. Pretty good sized piece of it. At some point too, I'm going to not be so careful to um, try to keep the corners intact and the whole bin intact. And at that point we'll be able to actually extract one of these large pieces of towel to see what kind of progress it's making. But I've been attempting to, uh, here's the other pine cone. <laughs> I've been attempting to try to um, not disturb the contents of this bin too much. Um, just so we would still have those opportunities to check in on some of these things without stirring the contents up too much. So we could really see how certain things are progressing and, you know, know where to find those things when we check back in. But um, it might be time soon to get into a little bit more of a disruptive mode and really start stirring up things in this container a little bit more than I've been doing. So the... Um, the corner feedings ended a couple feedings ago, I believe. So for the past couple feedings, we've been putting in the food down the middle. And that's where we're going to put it in today, too. So I'm just going to see if I can sort of dislodge the material that's in the middle to open up a little bit of a, a gully to drop today's food portion into. I'm encountering some of the old food bits that were placed in here previously. Here's a banana stem. Here's some more of that towel. <laughs> the towel kind of runs across our feeding area at this point. It intercepts the, the gully area. Um, so there again, I don't want to pull that out because who knows, it's going to make a big mess. But at some point I'll definitely be curious to see what's going on with that towel and try to pull out a good large chunk of it to get a better view of how things are progressing after you know, 75 days now. Next time we check in, it will be even closer to 100 days of composting action on the beach towel. And we're getting little snippets of it here and there. Here's another chunk of it. So maybe the pieces are not quite as long as I had remembered. For some reason, I thought they were pretty big and that pulling one out would become a real mess. So um, I've been reluctant to do so. So, you know, at some point soon, we'll definitely try to get a good sense of how this towel is progressing. And it'll be a little bit difficult to tell because of the um, the deterioration that was caused by the UV bombardment over many years versus what's been done more recently by the worms. So we've got ourselves a nice little hole here to drop the food into. Certainly not as much leftover... Um, certainly not as much leftover carbon based um, bedding type materials so I'm glad that I held on to two of the three coffee filters that I bought down here because um, we will use both of them here for sure because there is a greater need for it here so now here's some of this leftover food bananas a couple banana stems we encountered earlier so we'll do the same here we'll drop in today's fresh portion and then we'll um, then we'll stack the older foods up on top of that. The one thing I'm noticing here, though, is these little babe, this this handful of worms here does seem to be um, dominated almost by little itsy bitsy small sized worms. I mean, yeah, there's a couple mature, larger sized worms in here, but I also see a tremendous number of very small, tiny worms in here too. And that's always a really good thing to see. At least I like to see that because I know that's a good sign that there's that there's you know breeding and um, expansion of the population going on in the system so it's certainly a welcome sight all right let's uh let's tear up these sheets of paper or chunks of paper that i bought down here for this not a lot of salvaged bedding material to go down under the feeding so we've got some fresh and you know 75 day old bin you know I, i'm trying to Think what my cutoff point is it really depends i guess on the the nature of the bin itself 
but at some point around 100 days of age I'll generally stop adding leaves for sure so I don't end up with a whole bunch of leaf stems like what we see here but also paper you know I don't want to have to be fishing stuff out of my finished compost when the time comes to harvest the compost I don't want it littered with all kinds of scraps of stuff that was put in as bedding so for a little while longer I think we'll be okay adding bedding to the feedings but at some point I might just resort to adding food only when it comes time to feed so it's not a very large feeding that's fine they've got a little bit of leftovers here so they're not direly desperate for food in here throw in a little bit of grit what else we got the coffee we'll try not to forget the coffee it always feels good when I tap out my coffee supply so I always know there's more to where that came from and there will be more in a couple days and then we could just stack in the few little bits of leftover food scraps that we encountered along the way mainly banana stems two banana stems a couple small peels that are pretty far gone too as far as their deterioration here's one of these sliced up um, avocado pits and if it was just a regular avocado pit it would take quite a long time for it to break down but it seems like when I slice it up like this the um, the material just becomes very easy to break apart in my hands when I find it so it's uh, it speeds things along a lot when you take one of those avocado pits and you slice them up it's got to do so really carefully because they're kind of slippery and you would hate to slice your finger open in the process trying to cut it but if you're careful you can very easily get a, at least the first cut in there so you could rest the um the seed on its flat the new flat end that was caused by the first cut of material off the edge of it and it's much easier to do the rest of the cutting after that all right so I think we'll just have to accept the fact that the material on the top surface is going to remain a little bit dry with that Tyvek covering. Um, the positioning of the plastic, well, let's see, I don't know. Maybe we'll try to position the plastic coverings a little bit more inboard because um, I'm still interested in trying to do something about these little pests that I find cruising around within the system. My only concern is that by putting in diatomaceous earth that I might be harming the isopods. And I really hope that that's not the case. But um, I'd really like to maybe sprinkle a little bit of diatomaceous earth around the edges again like I did a couple feedings ago. So that any um, mites or any of these little flying insects that I'm seeing here will hopefully stumble on that stuff. And, um, and it'll, you know, do away with them. So uh, I'm going to go grab my bag of diatomaceous earth and we're going to sprinkle a little bit of that stuff around the very outer perimeter. And then with the Tyvek covering, it does seem like it's going to allow for things to dry out sufficiently to allow that diatomaceous earth to be effective because the stuff is useless when it's damp. But as long as it's dry, it's going to work well in terms of um, taking out little um, insects. Uh, let me go grab that stuff and we'll scatter some of it into the system now. So I do have a pretty good sized bag of this stuff so I, I can be generous. A lot of people receive a little duster sort of apparatus with which to apply this stuff which my bag of diatomaceous earth did not. <laughs> so I have to use sort of a manual spreading method which doesn't really dust it. I'm pretty much just pouring it at this point. But I got plenty of this stuff to go around so I don't have to be skimpy. And this stuff's not going to harm the worms. A lot of people, you know, comment about how it's going to cause issues for the worms. It's not going to cause a problem for the worms. The worms are going to be just fine. The whole idea here is that this stuff is, um, it's got the consistency of flour. It's super fine. But if it gets caught in between the, the layers of a insect's exoskeleton it um it's got very sharp edges microscopically sharp edges which um kind of lacerate in between those layers causing the uh 
causing the insect to lose whatever little tiny bit of moisture that's within its body that it relies on to live. Doing away with the insect. So like I said, my hope is that I'm not going to be knocking out the poor little isopods by putting this stuff in. But my aim is to really get rid of the mites and possibly the flying insects. So we're pretty much done here. Just got a few things that I need to put away. The um, I'm trying to remember now. Did we add grit? <laughs> I don't remember. Sometimes I forget to include certain things. But I know we did away with all the coffee and we did away with all the food, so that was the important thing. If they miss grit on this go around, that's fine. They'll get some next time. All right, everyone. Well, that's it for today. Hopefully, you enjoyed the video. If you did, as always, please remember to leave me a thumbs up. That's always really appreciated. And if you haven't done so already, please also consider subscribing to the channel too. That's really appreciated as well. All right, everyone, have a great day. Thanks for watching.